arts as categories can be used, of course, to criticize state capitalism because state capitalism is just capitalism for Marx, right? The state is emerging out of the crisis of the economy and it's managing the crisis of the, co the economy, right? It's not some self-regulating system of private property, right? It's not bourgeois society, right? It's capitalist, right? And that means that the state is like suffusing society, right? The way Marx describes it, it's clogging the pores of society. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Spencer Leonard is here today. He's the uh, former editor of Sublation Magazine. He's a founding member of the Platypus Affiliated Society. He is a, a historian, uh, a Marxist. He has two books on Marxist journalism. That is that are well worth picking up. They're beautiful editions, and uh, today he's going to be following up and talking to me about Proudhon. I recently talked to Cyber Dandy and Ben Burgess about Proudhon, um, and received word from Spencer that he thought Proudhon and Marx deserved a more thorough treatment, and then than what was offered by Cyber Dandy and and myself and Ben. So I just want to start there. Um, what do you think was the, I mean, maybe there's so many things that it would be hard to to tell me briefly, but what do you think we missed as we discussed Proudhon and Marx? Sure. Thanks for having me on, Doug. Oh, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Sorry, I should have started with that. Yeah, no, uh, no problem. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I think when, you know, when I watch these streams, you know, I, I think of students, right. And, you know, people who might be interested in like reading these books and, and things like that. And, and I just got the sense that like, you know, kids are being miseducated in the sense that like, it's hard, right. This stuff is hard and it, you know, it's hard uh not because it's like you know like advanced mathematics or or something like that that you have to you know, have a lot of, of of kind of mastery to understand it but you do have to understand something about the um the kind of books that you're reading you know um and and we just don't have uh books like these uh, and so uh, the most basic thing, you know, obviously, that discussion, uh, you know, largely centered on on Marx's poverty of philosophy, and you know, I think that's a a more important book. But you know, I also thought, you know, and obviously, it's you know, at the time, Proudhon's book was more important, like for sure. Marx's book, you know, was a dud. Uh, it didn't find many readers. It didn't have much influence. It wasn't translated uh, into German or to English for decades. It wasn't widely read in French. Uh, Proudhon's book, of course, had a uh, was immediately translated uh, into, I believe, German. Partially translated into English had a huge effect. Proudhon is, you know, was and is a, a giant figure, but. You know, we are haunted by Marxism, obviously, um, and ultimately Marxism does assume leadership in the most advanced socialist movements in the world, and that's why uh, you know Marx's writings are important to us. But um, it, it's a matter of thinking about, like, you know, what kind of thing is the Marx-Proudhon dialogue? 
right? And so one of the things that I that, that I um, you know just at the very basic level, uh, I think that it was kind of staged as like a debate, right? And I know that you know Ben Burgess likes debate, and that's that's great. You know, there's a place for that. Uh, but Marx isn't debating Proudhon here. And so there were a lot of comments like, oh, he's sniping at Proudhon. And then a lot of the debate was like, is he generous? Or I think, uh, you know, he was called, Marx was called like a street brawler. Um, you know, like, is he like scoring points? Uh, and I think that, you know, this really misses out what's going on because uh, you know I'll, I'll start using some words that are you know that, that won't have any meaning for young people uh, but hopefully they can attach some meaning to them as we go along uh, Marx's is an eminent dialectical critique of Proudhon right which means what it means that his book is taking up Proudhon as a profoundly um, emblem, you know, emblematic, telling, insightful symptom of his time. And he's trying to think through that book and this figure of Proudhon in order to better understand his time and its tasks. He has immense respect for Proudhon. Um, obviously, um, you can see it in the Holy Family where he talks about Proudhon very generously. Um, you know, and, and Marx's engagement with Proudhon is, you know, it's not the only one. There are many, many uh, streams of socialism, types of socialism that, um, that he's building out his own thought out of. But for, but Proudhon has this sense that you know at the end of the day, uh, the issue is social, right? It's the it's the nature of society that's that issue. Uh, it's not uh, political, right? Um, and Proudhon obviously has a great allergy to politics. Marx criticizes him for that allergy. He's hostile to politics. He's hostile to democracy. Can you tell um, me what, what the distinction is for Proudhon and for Marx between the social and the political? Just to clarify that, because I think that it sounds easy, but maybe there's a, is it the difference between uh, engaging with the state or engaging in civil yes. society? Yes. Okay. It, 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 it's a question of, um, you know, for Proudhon, you know, the, 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 the problem that he's trying to address is what he would consider kind of injustice in the economic structure of society, right? Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't think that, um, for instance, overthrowing the government or seeking to overthrow the government is going to be particularly fruitful. Uh, because that's not what, you know, the problem isn't at the level for him of the law, right? Mm -hmm. It's at the level of the practices in society um, and that the practices in society are, in a sense, inadequate to uh, their own concept, um, right? To their own inner dynamics and their own, uh, you know, and, and, and to even the way you know, we think of the, our society is based on, for instance, free exchange. He thinks that um, you know we need to achieve like a social equality that we haven't achieved, right? So, so Marx, and obviously, uh, you know, Proudhon is, is is the first to use the word anarchy, right? Um, to mean not what it meant to ruling classes in the past, uh, which was a kind of chaos. And we, you know, we still have that usage of, uh, you know, anarchy is bad, anarchy is chaos. Uh, but you know, Proudhon uses it to mean that, you know, it, it kind of etymologically uh, that there is no one ruling. Um, and 
he counterposes that to democracy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's a very powerful influence on Marx. Right? Marx agrees with that, right? Marx agrees that um, you know the goal socialism can be described as anarchy, right? Lenin will take this up, you know, in State and Revolution, you know, that the goal, you know, so, so the conflict between, or the dispute between Marxists and anarchists, at least from a Marxist point of view, is not over the final goal of socialism, right? Um, they agree about things like that. They agree that, you know, we should live in a society, uh, you know, where there is no organized coercive political force. And, you know, Proudhon views, for instance, democracy as a form of the state, right? Um, you know, Marx will take that up um, as well. So, um, you know, but in, in this book, right, in this dialogue, in this sort of high point of, of the Marx Proudhon uh, engagement. I mean, there's a prior engagement, you know, that should be pointed out, which is, um, you know, Marx has a, a very deep engagement with Proudhon's book, What is Property, mm -hmm. which, which is perhaps a better book. Marx thinks it's a better book uh, from 1840. Uh, Marx's engagement with that book is runs like a light motif through the 1844 manuscripts, mm -hmm. or what are sometimes called the economic and philosophical manuscripts or the Paris manuscripts. Um, and there will be later engagements, certainly political engagements with Proudhonists. Um, mm -hmm. that Engels toys with the idea of, of writing uh, a, a response to, to Engels's book on the 1848 revolution, the, the general idea of, the revolution in the 19th century would be the English translation of that. Um, it's left as notes, but the notes are fascinating. Uh, it's a running engagement. So who is Proudhon and why do they want to engage him? Um, they, Marx, I guess I would, you know, I'd put it this way. Marx is coming out of a, Origin in an originary way, he's coming out of an engagement with the aftermath of Hegelian philosophy um, in Germany, which you know ultimately he will come to think of as, uh, in in many ways, you know, kind of a backward environment and a kind of a backward expression or a backward set of symptoms. Like, why should the crisis of society be expressed through philosophy? But that is the way that um, the crisis of bourgeois society, the crisis really, you could say, of, of, of history, of the unfolding of freedom, um, manifests for Marx as a young man. Uh, he's in the Hegelian world of university students in Germany. Um, and that world is highly politicized by the time he comes along. He's younger than almost all of the famous young Hegelians. And he, by the time he comes along, it's, it's very clear that the new king of Germany is a reactionary and that you know, liberalism isn't unfolding somehow the way it's supposed to. Uh, and so what began as a kind of you know, philosophical attempt to advance Hegel's philosophy, uh, Hegel's system, uh, like in David Strauss's Life of Jesus, uh, the first work of the Young Hegelians, that explodes into like a highly politicized environment of like left and right Hegelians. And, and the left Hegelians are deeply influenced by socialist crimes. Uh, I, I, I want to ask you, I want to ask you a yeah. clarifying question about two things at once. And I hope that I'm being dialectical. I'm not sure I am, but um, you just were talking about uh, Marx coming out of the young Hegelian tradition and 
the situation in Germany uh, at that time with the reactionary king. And um, right before we started talking, I got a message from mm. uh, a patron in response to the uh, stream that we did about Marxism and how to engage with the right or think about left and right positions and the importance of bourgeois or liberal values for socialism. And uh, the, this patron, bear with me here because I'm getting somewhere. Uh, this patron asks, sure. does the Socialist Party have enemies? And I asked, well, why do you ask that? And he says, well, if you read Marx, he's talking about sending the bourgeoisie to hell. And he quotes from uh, the critique of the philosophy of right. War on the German state of affairs, by all means, they are below the level of history. Um is this what someone who is trying to uphold the values of bourgeois society sounds like? He asks. Sounds more like someone who understood that bourgeois society was born bathed in blood, just like capitalism. And um, so I, hmm. I went back. He's getting the, that out of the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I went back and kind of looked at, uh, he uh, you know, Marx's critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. And um, it seemed to me that uh, that's the text I've read before, or at least the introduction I've read before. Mm -hmm. um, but I had been a little while and I've read the German ideology and it seemed like those two texts were related, you know, that these are similar texts. Hegel is kind of a definitive bourgeois philosopher, I think. Uh, uh, it seems to me. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. And Marx would so, agree with that, certainly. Yeah. And um, his critique of Hegel and of the Hegelians, both in the German ideology and in the uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, is and actually it's in Proudhon, in the critique of, the, of Proudhon as well, is not aimed at them as villains or enemies or um, criminals or Surely not. immoral uh murderers or it is um it he's charging them all with not having gone deeply enough into their under, own understanding of things to uh truly bring forward their ideas right that the the charge is that they're stuck they're idealists they're stuck in their own ideas in the realm of philosophy so anyhow i wanted to ask like basically two things at once what is it to how is he doing an eminent critique in in these three instances with the uh, proudhon with the uh, critique of hegel um in the german ideology and what is he critiquing politically or historically in that moment at the same time um is that i hope that's yeah sure confusing. um you know, Lenin has a very famous remark where he says, you know, Marx writes, the first time Marx writes as Marx is in the poverty of philosophy, right? That's the, Marx has arrived, whatever he's, whatever's happening before that. Now, of course, you know, Lenin didn't have what we have. There's, you know, a lot of the young Marx that we read are, are manuscripts, you know, like the 1844 mm -hmm. manuscripts and the German ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have more than Lenin had, uh, but, you know, Lenin had plenty. And, and what I would say is that, you know, first of all, about Marx on Hegel in 1843, um, first of all, that is liberalism. That's the way that it was understood. Uh, that's a liberal paper that Marx is editing. He's getting paid to edit it by industrialists. Right. Um, in the city of Cologne. Right. So people thought of this as like a liberal critique of an illiberal government. Right. It's an illiberal government. And liberals are perfectly capable of being vociferous uh, in their criticisms. Right. Um, and, and, and I would say, you know, while Marx is saying things there about the proletariat, uh, it's very incipient, and I, w I don't think that it's 
Um, I don't think that Marx is, is anywhere, you know, close to where he's going to be in 1847, 48. Right there, and, I mean, what he, what he says is that the bourgeoisie, he, he basically says the bourgeoisie became the class representing all classes, but to, to truly arrive at um, liberal values and paraphrase, I mean, really putting a gloss, the proletariat will have to take power. They're the, they're the class that can actually... For right. What I would say is, uh, you know, it gets to your question, right? Which is like, mm -hmm. what is this imminent critique business? You right. know, the, the the biggest problem with, I would say, with that text is, I, I would say that Marx is least interesting on Hegel when he's talking about Hegel, um, or when he's criticizing Hegel. And in fact, mm -hmm. what you see is that he stops criticizing Hegel, uh, and he basically stops. Uh, criticize. He also doesn't criticize uh, bourgeois political economy. So what are we looking at in Proudhon? Right here is a French intellectual, a legatee of the French Revolution, someone who's thinking about how to push forward. I think Cyber Dandy in the dialogue with Ben Burgess rightly pointed out, like maybe it was Ben, who I don't know who pointed out, you know, Proudhon accepts the French Revolution as the um, irreversible verdict of history, the settled verdict of history. No doubt, he does. Uh, he thinks, he's asking the question, what is the task of the 19th century? What is our task? And he's turning to English political economy as he can read it, um, whether through its French interpreters or in translation, and he's turning to German philosophy in this text. And so here we have, and also it should be pointed out, that Proudhon is a working class intellectual, right, which is very important for Marx, right, because he's seeing, like, Okay, this socialism stuff that people are talking about, that these like Saint Simon and Fourier and Owen and these different sort of reformers have been talking about, it's in the working class. It, it's you know, it's not that you have like a working class movement on one on the one hand and intellectuals talking about it on the other, but you're actually getting working class intellectuals. Right? So there's a figure named Weitling uh, from Germany, uh, there's Proudhon in France, there are innumerable such figures in, amongst the Chartists in England by this time. And so Marx is looking at this working class intellectual and on behalf of, if you will, the working class, he is trying to synthesize French political philosophy, French socialism, in that sense, um, German idealist philosophy and English political economy. In other words, what people normally say Marx is doing, right? People say Marx is the synthesis of French and English and German, you know, political, philosophical and economic thought. So here's Proudhon doing it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so what is Marx's criticism of Proudhon? Uh, in broad terms, and this is where another, another thing that was said in that stream, I just thought, okay, no, 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 no. It, you know, it was said that you know, Marx's, Marx's defense of the honor of the bourgeois economists was mm -hmm. the least interesting thing in the poverty of philosophy. No, <laughs> it, right. it's I, supremely I I interesting. That. Didn't I object uh, you, to that? With, you you, you know. might have done. You might have done. And, you know, I, I'm sure that you could explain what I'm explaining to. Um, yeah, no, you know, no, yeah. But, you, I mean, you were I, hosting that better. conversation. No. Uh, you know, so you, you, you were hosting that conversation and it may have gone off another direction. But it, it, it came up a couple of times. And mm -hmm. Marx, Marx is not only defending... Smith and Ricardo and English political economy, he's defending Hegel, right? And what he's seeing is that just as the young Hegelians in trying to advance Hegel's philosophy, 
mm-hmm. we're actually falling below the threshold of Hegel's philosophy. And that's where I would say like there's a shift from like 43 from like the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right towards like the German ideology, right? Mm-hmm. Where the German ideology, the object of critique is not Hegel. It's the young Hegelians, right? And in fact, he's saying that they are less imminent to the historical process than Hegel was. And he right? says the same kind of thing of Proudhon, who was a young Hegelian himself, right? I think that you just said that. And so, I mean, in, in effect, Proudhon is a young Hegelian, right? He's a yeah. Marx, Marx treats Proudhon in very much the way he comes to treat like Feuerbach, mm-hmm. right? And in fact, um, you know, Proudhon didn't know German mm-hmm. and, you know, you know, people like us, right. Who like sit around and like read books to get ideas because our world is so stupid. <laughs> we, we, we think that, well, Proudhon didn't know Hegel. Proudhon fucking knew Hegel. <laughs> Pardon my language. Proudhon <laughs> knew Hegel because he was surrounded by people who lived and breathed it. Right. And we have the stories of him staying up all night talking to Mikhail Bakunin, who was another basically young Hegelian who had studied in, in Germany uh, mm-hmm. at around the time of Marx. Uh, all night sessions uh, talking with Karl Marx. You know, having I'd rather I'd rather learn Hegel by having it having Marx explain it to me than reading any amount of Hegel. <laughs> You know, <laughs> right? Really, you know, um, you know, yeah. it's, it's taking more time to have it explained to me, uh, probably than it would take to read the complete works of Hegel. Uh, and then he had a a, 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 a very close friend, uh, Karl Grun, uh, who was one of what is called a true socialist, uh, who was a Feuerbachian. And if you if you watch the Young Marx movie, like this is is very clearly depicted, though. Like why Marx and Grun don't like each other, you know, just seems like interpersonal or something, um, because it's a movie. Um, mm-hmm. But Grun is also just explaining Hegel to, and and there were books about Hegel in French, uh, mm-hmm. you know. So so even before Proudhon made these friendships, he was reading about Hegel in French, and you can see it in. Um, you know, what is property, which is an early book, before, certainly before Marx and Grun knew, uh, or, or Bakunin knew uh, Proudhon. So, so Proudhon is attempting to advance political economy, and he's attempting to advance dialectical philosophy, and he's attempting to advance, you know, essentially post-revolutionary French political thought, which is overwhelmingly socialist in its most avant-garde forms. Um, And what Marx is saying is that you're falling below the threshold of bourgeois society, right? So it's not Not just of this bourgeois thinker, but a bourgeois society. That's a bourgeois society, right? That socialism itself is an expression of the crisis of bourgeois society, Mm -hmm. right? Um, and and so you know, just as the young Hegelians can't be as coherent as Hegel, right? So what is the German ideology saying, right? It's which I would say if 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 Lenin looked at the German ideology, he would see a lot of the poverty of philosophy uh, in it. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. definitely you know um, historical materialism or whatever. Right, I, uh, I is it's very too. much there. Yeah. Right. You and I read some of the German ideology together. Mm-hmm. Um, right. I know that you ran like a reading group for your Patreons on that wonderful mm-hmm. text. And at the heart of that, you know, Marx is saying, you're not taking being a German ideologue as itself a symptom. Right. You're not thinking about what it is about this society that's producing ideology like this, right? You're not thinking about, oh, we're 
expressive of a crisis of philosophy that's telling us something about our time. The most profound thing about Marx to understand or that the way in which Marx is becoming Marx even before 1848 is that, you know, obviously, you know, Chris and I will talk about the significance of the revolution and lessons of the revolution of 1848 and the 18th Brumaire and the books that I edited and Bonapartism and all of these things, which, which do develop and transform Marx's thinking. But how is Marx becoming Marx before 1848, right? Mm -hmm. He's becoming Marx before 1848 because he's recognizing that he's in a fundamentally new circumstance. And he's, you know, for Proudhon, it's just sort of a new stage, right? There was the stage of political equality. That's what the French Revolution was. And now we're in the stage of like social equality, right? And Marx is realizing no, we're in the stage of the self-contradiction of bourgeois society, right? We're not in a new stage exactly, but it's also the case that we can't just carry on with the Enlightenment, right? Mm -hmm. That the, the, the project of the Enlightenment has in some sense you know, been realized. And in its realization, it's revealing itself to be self-contradictory, right? Uh, so bourgeois society is in the era of capital, right? Bourgeois society is self-contradictory. Uh, one nice, I think, felicitous phrase for this is uh, Louis Menon, uh, in the in his introduction to uh, to the Finland Station, that kind of history of socialism by Edward Edmund Wilson, says Marx and Engels are philosophes of the Second Enlightenment. Right, which is that a lot of what Marx is thinking about is what is my relationship to Hegel to Adam Smith, to Ricardo. And here he has Proudhon, and he says, well, you're trying to advance political economy, but look how much better and clearer Ricardo is, hmm. right? Like, hmm. you know, if you read him, it'll just be like deflationary. He'll be like, well, he has all this highfalutin dialectical rhetoric, right? It's super overcharged and rhetorical. But here, you know, in in you know, cynically, uh, is is the way he, you know, he, he, Ricardo sounds cynical because he's just cutting to the chase, right? Is it immoral? Is it unfortunate that people are commodities? That labor is a commodity that has a price and that it might not find a market. And Ricardo, you know, as, he, as, as Mark says in the text, Ricardo treats it like hats. You produce hats. Hats have a price. What is the price of the hat? The cost of the production of the hat, just like labor power, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and like, Just like a human being in the world. Right. You know, and right. the socialists yeah. are like, this is terrible. This is immoral. Right. And Marx is like, yeah, but it's the truth. Right. It, the, you know, is the fact immoral? Right. Is it Ricardo's fault that this is the way that it is? And in a sense, in you know, Proudhon trying to uh, go beyond Ricardo ends up botching just elemental political economy. And I think a lot of the discussion uh, with 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 Ben and and Cyber Dandy like fell down around this. Right. That like when. Proudhon starts talking about exchange, right? He falls below the threshold of Ricardo. Right. Right. Um, you know, Ricardo, I mean, I'm sorry, Proudhon thinks like, well, there's a buyer and there's a seller. And the buyer is interested in the use value and the seller is interested in the exchange value. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And Marx is like, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> you know, and of course he's, you know, of course the point is generally true, but I'll illustrate it with respect to, you know, the labor market. Um, you know, someone who's hiring somebody else is, is a buyer. He's interested in the, um, the worker's ability to do the specific job. Right. Right. So he's interested in the use value of you know, the working, the specific working capacity of the worker. And he's also interested in how much it's going to cost to hire him. And the, the capitalist is both offering the worker a specific job description. Like I want you to do this. Right. So he's offering him a use value, like a specific set of productive forces to mobilize with his labor. And he's offering him a wage. Right. It's not wait, that wait, like uh, one uh, exists on in one pole and the other exists. In the, both are commodities. Right. Uh, yeah, but go ahead. The, the worker presenting a use value to the uh, bo capitalist boss. And, of course. Yeah. And, and of course he is. And has, and it right. has, not uh, everybody can do every job, obviously. But he also needs the exchange value so that he can turn around and the money, the wage, so he can turn around and buy commodities he needs, um, you know, and so forth. Yeah. No, what, what I absolutely understand what you're saying, and we're on the same page. But the, what struck me um, about mm -hmm. in that conversation was that when you not only, when you uh, when when Ben Burgess said, "Oh, you know, the Marx defending the honor of the bourgeois economist was the least uh, interesting thing in the text." Do you miss out on the historical and political reality of the text, right? And the fact that Marx was was had, as you said, was looking back on the bourgeois economist as a reflection of society when it was functioning a bit better and not caught up in capital, but also you won't understand the details of the critique um, that Marx is pulling out of having read Proudhon. Like it, the fact that Proudhon is not even arriving at as deep an understanding of political economy as Adam Smith or Ricardo or the bourgeois economists is significant a significant critique of his uh, attempt to, to move beyond that level to socialism. And anyway, anyway, I'm just, I'm sure. At this, at, yeah, no, 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 at the at, absolutely. Yeah. At, at the mm -hmm. same time, what, what is Proudhon grasping, right? He's grasping that political economy is metaphysics, right? It, like these categories are categories of freedom, right? These categories are, you know, Adam Smith is a philosopher in the wealth of nations, not just in the theory of moral sentiments, right? Mm -hmm. He, you know, that's just, if you will, a historical fact that I can use to illustrate the point that Adam Smith was by profession a philosopher and he wrote The Wealth of Nations. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, in a deeper sense for Marx, you know, the categories of political economy are the categories of our actual social life, right? And he thinks that people like Hegel understood this. You know, Hegel just, Hegel picked up Adam Smith and he read The Wealth of Nations and he picked up, you know, whatever else, Rousseau or Kant or Condor say, it was all the same thing. For him, right? He knew that this is one conversation about freedom, mm -hmm. right? And like the, you know, so, so what makes it bourgeois, right? That for, for Adam Smith in his time, right? The categories like use value and exchange value were critical categories, right? He was saying, we should live in a commodity society. You know, we should live in a society characterized by, 
you know, wages and profits and rents, not a society, you know, based on like serfs and lords and this and that, right? Like it's a bourgeois critique of estates, you know, of the caste system, if you will, um, and saying, no, we should all be equal, right? We should be commodity owners. It should, if, if there's, you know, it, it should be the society of the third estate, right? Of the a, a productive society. At the same time, you know, when you read it, it feels like Adam Smith is, even though, like, you know, it takes, it takes an immense amount of work to realize that Adam Smith is a totally revolutionary critic of his time. Why? Because when we read it, it just feels like a description of the status quo. Right. It feels like a description of the world as it is. And in a sense, um, you know, political economy and philosophy is like that. Right. On the one hand, it's a it's a critique of the past and it's a, a philosophy of history. That leads up to the present moment. Right. So Hegel's, you know unfolding of spirit in history is all about the emergence of bourgeois society <laughs> over 10,000 years, right? Mm -hmm. All philosophy leads to Hegel. All history leads to the present, right? Mm -hmm. For Adam Smith, all history leads to a society of wages, profits, and rent. Everything else is a sort of an imperfect realization of that. Right. Mm -hmm. there, there was wages. There were wages, profits and rent in feudalism, but it's kind of masked by, you know, this confusion. Right. So bourgeois society is a bourgeois thought is a thought of change and development. And it's also a description of the way things are. And Hegel is the end of philosophy. Right. Bourgeois society is the end of history. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, both of those things, like that's not a problem for the bourgeois ideologues, right? But for us, right, no, this society's realization, like its, it's self-realization in history is actually the emergence of its self-contradiction. Now, there's a Hegelian dimension to that, but it's also, in a sense, a kind of a Hegel squared, right? Because it's freedom that's in contradiction with freedom, right, in yeah. bourgeois society. And you can right? see that in, in the world when people's freedoms contradict or different kinds of freedoms contradict, right? Right. Exactly. And so, you know, Proudhon puzzles over these things. You know, he does. He's like, well... You know, there's the free will of, of this individual and, the you know, there's the free will of the buyer and the free will of, will of the seller. And, you know, Marx, of course, has like a field day with these things. Right. Um, and the, and so he's he makes this materialist turn. Right. Like, what is this materialist turn of, 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 of Marx about? And really, it's about what I was saying before. It's it's. It's really about understanding that um, it's a, it's about a self understanding of your time, like where I, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, where am I in history? That's really what it's about. It's not like material, like this coffee cup is material and it's anti idealist. No, um, the, he takes the word up because it's a Feuerbach word. Right, Feuerbach says, I'm going to radicalize Hegel. I'm going to get like material about it. Right, it's going to, I'm going to talk about sensuous human beings. Right. Um, and Marx is like, well, Hegel was talking about sensuous human beings. Rousseau was talking about sensuous human beings. What are you talking about? Like material. Like, of course, this is, you know, this is a subject object dialectic. And, and by the way, subject object isn't the same thing as like material and thinking in your head, right? That's not mm -hmm. the point. Um, and so, so Feuerbach in his like materialism is like a degradation. That last of, point you made is really important. I'm reading the science of logic. Can, can you, um, 
Can you say that again? The subject object distinction is not the same as objects, material objects out here and the thoughts in your head. Uh, right. What, how is it that the subject is not simply the thoughts in your head? I know that I may be taking you off onto a path, that, but I want to hear you say, because I agree with you, but it's, I'm reading the science. Because, yeah. well, I mean, in a sense, you know, it, I mean, first of all, it's not just the thoughts in our head that are you know, our, our practices and our reflections on those practices, right? Um, it's, it's not that our reflection on them is like immaterial or something. No, it, you know, it, it, it's, you know, I, I guess, you know, if you think about something like, um, Would one way to be, to put this would be like when you have even the thoughts in your head, aren't the thoughts in your head. That when you when you consider an idea like the idea of this cup, you have uh, the history of develop of the development, the really existing history of the development of cups, informing your conceptions, which are then in your own in your head. So that right, that and nature concept- itself, right, the natural world that you've created for yourself, right, right, like the, like the natural yeah. world that has come to be. Uh-huh. is itself crying for transformation. Right? Right. Like one of my favorite film you know, one one of my favorite scenes, at least in like a popular movie, is in, in Glory, in the film about the Civil War. It's a wonderful movie. And right before like this like organized, like you know, these these free black regiment, right, starts to storm this confederate stronghold right and this quest for freedom that the whole movie's about you know reaches this crescendo the filmmaker i think his name is edward zwick cuts to a scene you know they're on the beach and they're storming like a, a fortress on the beach and the camera cuts to the sea and mm-hmm seagulls fly over this distant sea, right? This this expanded expansive vista of the sea. And what you're looking at is the demand for freedom. Right? In this like <laughs> natural world. Right? Like that's mm-hmm. what it's it, it's a it's a profoundly Hegelian like moment in the film. Right? Um and so you know, the, 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 the tasks that we're engaged in, you know, or in, 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 in our, our society, you know, to put it in more sort of political economic terms, mm-hmm. our uh, collective sociality, right? And Marx plays with this because, you know, Proudhon is wonderful. One of the things I, you know, I, I, I I remarked to you uh, in our chat, as I said, you know, I, I really love the first bit by Proudhon where he's talking about God mm-hmm. and you were like, Oh, well that's because tw- yeah, you said in the stream, Oh, the first bit's twat. Right. I'm like, no, 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 it's, it's great. Right. Why? Because Proudhon is basically saying God is society there. Right. God is a category for the self-reflection of human uh, uh, for humans to reflect on their collective humanity. And so what's least interesting about God is the idea that like he's behind like the solar system, like he's like the first cause, like a creationist God. That's a boring God. The scientists don't need that hypothesis. But this hypothesis of like God acting in history. And mm-hmm. providence, like that's super interesting, right? And that's, of course, Proudhon just Marx or Bakunin or Karl Grun had just reproduced the introduction to the lectures on the philosophy of history where Hegel says exactly that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that our sense of providence is our sense of the unfolding of free, you know, the religious notion of providence is our sense of the unfolding of freedom in history. And and so Proudhon is, on the one hand, this arch individualist, right? He's an anarchist. He's all about individual freedom, right? And on the one hand, on the other hand, 
he's super interesting because he's got this concept of society. Like he's got a, he's really got the concept of society in the sense that he understands that society is more than the sum of its parts. Right. Um, and yet he's like really struggling with that. And he turns it in, it's, it becomes an antinomy for him that Marx is critiquing. Um, can I, but, can I tell you why I, but, I said that first part was twaddle and you can mm -hmm. explain to me what, what I'm doing wrong. Um, or it's like for me, having read Feuerbach and then the critique of Feuerbach and the German ideology uh, and the and the eleven theses. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the and having experienced Christopher Hitchens and the Four Horsemen and the and the New Atheism. Okay, it all just seems like shooting fish in, in a barrel to me to read that opening to of Proudhon's. It doesn't. I and I think that uh, so like and to compare Feuerbach to the new atheists is completely unfair. It's unfair to Feuerbach, right? But nonetheless, I have this experience of atheism as being kind of a dead end critique of society. That it um it the oh, yeah. atheism itself has gone wrong, and so that's why when I read the beginning of Proudhon, I go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, God's dead, I understand, there's no God, we're we, fine, you know, whatever. Um, right. And I don't pick up on God acts in society, What the way we should understand God is as our collective freedom. I don't, you know, I don't even get to that as I'm reading, I'm sort of skimming it, but, so, mm -hmm. um, maybe you could tell me, like, what, it, how do you think it is that the young Hegelian critique of God ended up with Christopher Hitchens and the new atheists. If, or if, if that's maybe too long a story, do you think that it, that's where? I mean, that I think that I, I, I think that, um, you know, and again, you know, here again, and I, 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 I don't know what, you know, Ben would say, you know, obviously Ben Burgess has written a book on uh, Christopher Hitchens. Hitchens. Um, you know, my, I wrote an article about Hitchens, uh, one of the first things I wrote for Platypus, uh, still, still proud of it. Um, you know, I would say that, um, Hitchens is atheism is the least interesting thing about Hitchens. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's just boring. Um, you know, Why? because religion is a social fact, to put it in Durkheimian terms. I mean, in a sense, you know, uh, a figure like Emile Durkheim, someone that Ashley would know very well as a sociologist, mm -hmm. um, is very, very much in the wake of Proudhon and of, of Auguste Comte, um, the founder of positivism and of sociology, who's a contemporary of Proudhon. Um, you know, religion is expressing society, right? Religion, you know, I'll, I'll just give you an example. I was telling you before we started the stream that um, I, you know, I was, uh, when, when I met um, Chris Catrone, my friend, um, I was a student of Sanskrit literature. And one of the funny things about Sanskrit literature and the, the vast literary inheritance of India uh, is that it, there are no historians in Sanskrit, right? Uh, there's just metaphysics and religion, right? Or overwhelmingly, that's what there is in Sanskrit. And, and of course, like you know, wonderful erotic courtly poetry to you know, amuse kings um, and their courtiers. But can you... Can you read, you know, so people will say India has no history. Very famous. You know, people will say, Hegel said that. And he meant something different by it. Um, and there's no doubt that it's significant that there are no historians in India. Um, that's telling us something for sure, you know, that there isn't a Herodotus or a Thucydides. Nevertheless, there is an immense archive of the history of religion like a staggeringly immense archive of the history of religion going back to, you know, older than the Bible and you know, older than the Homeric epics. And you can see 
the self-consciousness of man transforming itself, of course, in that history of religion. And it has very interesting parallels to the kinds of things that you know, the young Hegelians were keying into, right? What were they keying into? You know, David Strauss writes a life of Jesus. They're super preoccupied with Christianity. Why? Because religion comes to recognize that the object of religion, you know, that the, the object of religion is the subject of religion, that it's man reflecting on man. Right, you're looking at Jesus. Right, you're looking at uh, God is a man. Right, you're. It's an image of society, actually. Mm-hmm. Right. Similarly, you know, in around the same time in India, they start worshiping images of a man. Right of the Buddha. Right. The you know, similar transformations are taking place in the evolution of spirit. In our time, right, modern philosophy and modern political economy are the equivalent of medieval metaphysics, right? They mm-hmm. are the way that we recognize ourselves, right? And it, you know, Marx is pointingly calling, pointedly calling it a metaphysics, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, you'll go on to say, like, we live in a metaphysical world, right? The fetishism of commodities, right? Why? Because as we disparagingly look at the metaphysics of the medieval past as a misrecognition of the freedom of humanity, actually, these categories, even though they, of course, are different, and they are real, and they do grasp the nature of society and the nature of the condition of man in a way that you know, me- medieval metaphysics cannot. Nevertheless, right, in the state of unmastery of our freedom, that we're in now in the 1840s where this freedom is contradictory with itself, right? It's like fetishism. It's like a savage beating like a, you know, a fetish doll, right? Um, You know, it's like trying to, you know, dance to make the thunder, right? (laughs) It's like that, right? It's like, it's like, you know, Indians doing a rain dance, Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we're caught up with a freedom problem that's pretty unmastered. Um, And and so for Marx thinks that Proudhon is right to, in a sense, restore the question of the metaphysics of political economy and the political economic character of philosophy and how underlying it all is a is, is, if you will, some kind of political project, right? And for him, it's not exactly directed at the state, right? Uh, it's, it's not democratic, um, but nevertheless, it's an inheritance of the French revolutionary project. He thinks of it in terms of mutual association and the like. Um, you know, cooperative. Listen, so while you've been talking about this, I've been kind of free associating with you know, I have a bit of full philosoph- uh, full philosophical background, and so I yeah. think um, I deviations, you know, and heresies pop into my mind when you're talking about this. And I want to bring up some of my heretical thoughts to you in the second half. So can, okay. can you stick around for a little while? We'll do a, a sure one. Sure. Well, I think this was it's a great very fun good, talking with you, Doug. Yeah, first half, and um, uh, I, and I I I guess I want to close out by saying. Back to this um, patron, you know, that uh, it's worth noting that, uh, in a sense, I think, um, Proudhon was uh, uh, was bourgeois, and that, that certainly Hegel was, and Adam Smith was, and when Marx would critique these uh, men, these philosophers, these radicals, um, these critics, uh, he was not doing so because he thought of them as 
enemies that need to be snuffed out. Despite lines like, you know, the point isn't to uh, look at your enemy as, a, as an, an object of interest, but to strike him or something like that, which is in the uh, uh, critique of, of philosophy of right. Uh, but would you would you concur with that? That when when we when we understand bourgeois philosophers and understand the bourgeois era, and which is I think and hopefully still our own, um, that we don't uh, view it as something we simply want to negate, or get rid of, or attack, or tear down. Or, or, or yeah, it, it's right. So the overarching issue is is dialectics here right mm -hmm. and, and that's what people are like that's what people are perceiving as like marx like sniping or cyber dandy said you know marx isn't like fair or something like that right because marx is relentless right in mm -hmm. his like just peeling proudhon apart what is it, what is he attacking He's attacking Proudhon's dialectic, right? He's saying, look, he wants to reconcile society. He wants justice. He wants to get rid of the bad and preserve the good. Marx is saying, no, we have to prosecute. We don't want to. We don't want to um, subdue the contradiction or manage the contradiction. We want to prosecute the contradiction to the to society beyond this society, right? To history beyond prehistory, right? We want a different. It's a different question of dialectics, right? And how we what it, how, what are the symptoms that have to be followed? Class, right? Proudhon is trying to make the proletariat property owners, mm -hmm. right? He's trying to create a society of equal property owners. Marx is saying this is a society that is destroying property. It's destroying capital and it's destroying the property that we have in labor. Right? The self-contradiction in society is expressed as negativity, which is to say that society is disintegrating even as it's being constituted, right? Which is what's generating these regressive dynamics that are producing the Feuerbach and the Proudhon and indeed socialism itself, right? Is an expression of, these, of, of this negative dialectic of the self-contradiction of freedom. And Marx is saying, we have to prosecute it through the phenomenal forms that it creates, right? That the highest expression of the crisis of modern society is the disintegration of the third estate in you know, the society of labor, which was both capital and labor, to the opposition of capital and labor, mm -hmm. right? And that's why, like, you know, this critique of Proudhon leads directly into passages in the manifesto, like the bourgeoisie accuses us of wanting to destroy property. And of course, Marx and Engels say, well, we do want to destroy property. Why? Because capital's destroying property, right? We we want you know, you're not, what you you say we're destroying property, but your society is destroying property. It's destroying our property and labor. It's creating crises that destroy capital. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not a question of property, no property. It's a question of this bourgeois category of property, of course, on which class hinges, as itself a site of the. Disintegration of society.
We're constantly trying to recreate property, both workers' property in ourselves, in our labor power, and the capitalists are trying to preserve, preserve the value of their capital, and which they can only do by valorizing it. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely that process that's going to generate, that generates crisis. But that property is always right. is often being transformed. Maybe not as well as it could be in a different in, in under social. Indeed, but it's it, being it, transformed uh, because it's being destroyed and reconstituted. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It can't be. Yeah. It, and and what Proudhon is trying to do is he's trying to stop the historical process. He's trying to yeah. stop the crisis, and this is why Marx calls him petty bourgeois. This is he's right. like a guy in a middle class guy and saying, Oh, we have to preserve this historic building. We can't, we can't, uh, we, we can't watch, I can't watch the beauty of the of this be torn down. And Marx is saying, you know, progress. He, he's he's like a he, he, you know, what is he? He's a he's a uh, he's a printer. That's that's Proudhon's job, mm -hmm. right? He worked in you know, an old style hand press print shops where the technology was not much different than Benjamin Franklin. And what's emerging are these massive steam presses, <laughs> right? right? And Marx is saying, let's go through the steam press, right? Yeah. The, the steam press is what's pointing, you know, the steam press and the proletarianization it generates is what's pointing towards the future. We can't hold on. To society right. as it was, right? That's why he calls Proudhon a reactionary. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>